Quick revision video on alkanes. So we'll start with the basic properties. Alkanes are hydrocarbons, so they contain carbon and hydrogen atoms only. They are saturated, so they've got single carbon-carbon bonds. All of the atoms are bonded via sigma bonds, so that's where the orbitals that contain the electrons overlap directly or end-to-end, -end, you can say. And because of that kind of overlap, sigma bonds allow free rotation. And finally, the shape around each carbon atom in an alkane is tetrahedral with a 109.5 degree bond angle. And that's because you've got four bonding pairs of electrons all repelling equally. So using methane as an example, there's a diagram there for methane, a 3D representation of methane. So you can see the wedge there shows that hydrogen is sticking out of the plane. The dashed line shows the hydrogen going back and the two solid lines represent in the plane. Quick look at the boiling points now. So for straight chain alkanes, the boiling points increase as the carbon chain gets longer. And that's because we've got induced dipole-dipole interactions or London forces between the alkane molecules and these are going to get stronger as you have more atoms and therefore more electrons in the molecule. So we would say that more energy is needed to overcome these intermolecular forces. We are not breaking covalent bonds. So if we look at branched isomers now, we've got the same number of electrons. So when you have branched isomers, the boiling points decrease as the degree of branching increases. And that's because the amount of branching or more branching means the induced dipole-dipole interactions get weaker. Branching reduces the ability for the molecules to close pack or reduces their surface contact. Some basics about reactivity now. So alkanes are typically unreactive and that's due to high bond enthalpies in the molecules. So the carbon-carbon bond and the carbon-hydrogen bond is quite strong and the bonds are very low in polarity so and that's because the carbon and hydrogen have very similar electronegativities so alkanes are unreactive so we'll look at some reactions that they can do so the first one is with oxygen so that's obviously combustion alkanes will combust completely in a plentiful supply of oxygen and that's going to give us carbon dioxide and water. So because of that, alkanes can be used as fuels because that's an exothermic reaction. So the example I'm going to use is octane. So this is one of the main hydrocarbons in petrol. So balancing that equation, I always do it in this order. So we've got eight carbons in the fuel. We're going to make eight moles of carbon dioxide. 18 hydrogens in the fuel. So we get half as many waters. So nine waters, and then we go and add up the oxygens on the right. So we've got eight, two, 16, plus nine is 25. And I always use a top heavy fraction. So 25 over two, O twos will balance the equation. If we don't have a plentiful supply of oxygen, we get incomplete combustion. So instead of making carbon dioxide, we make carbon monoxide or even carbon. If the oxygen amount is very, very low, we still get water. So problems with that, carbon monoxide is a toxic gas. It reduces the blood's ability to carry oxygen. And carbon, solid, these are soot particulates. So the picture there is shown incomplete combustion taking place in a car engine. So we get that black soot coming out of the exhaust and that's classed as a respiratory irritant. So moving on now to the reaction with halogen, so chlorine, bromine, for example, Alkanes react with halogens but only in the presence of UV light. They're unreactive because of their very strong non-polar bonds. The reaction proceeds via a radical substitution mechanism. Now I'm going to go through the mechanism on the next slide. So a couple of examples for you. The first example is the reaction between ethane and chlorine, obviously in the presence of UV. And you can see there we've made chloroethane and hydrogen chloride. Now the second example I've taken propane, still reactant with chlorine in the presence of UV, 
and you can see there I've made one chloropropane. So the chlorine is substituted with a hydrogen on, a, on the end carbon there. But the point I'm going to make now is because we've got sort of more than one option in terms of um, hydrogens on carbon atoms, you can see in that second version of this reaction, the substitution is taking place on that middle carbon there. So one of these hydrogens now has substituted with the chlorine. So that example has produced two chloropropane. So because of that, substitution can occur anywhere on the carbon chain, so it's not a good synthetic method if you want to make a single organic compound. And the other problem with this reaction is if your halogen's in excess, you can get further substitutions. So these are mono substitution products, so one chloro and two chloropropane, but the example at the bottom of the screen there, that's a di-substituted product, so I've made one 2-dichloropropane there. Now, ultimately, if there was enough halogen in excess, all of the hydrogens would be substituted with um, chlorines in this case. So, not a great method for producing a single organic compound. So we'll look at the mechanism now. So remember, it's in three stages. So the initiation step is the first step, and that's where the UV light breaks the chlorine's covalent bond, and we produce two chlorine radicals. So that's classed as homolytic fission, and that's because the two electrons in the covalent bond that's broken are shared equally. So essentially, each chlorine receives one of the electrons from the bond and becomes a very reactive radical. So the propagation step takes place next. So here's the first of the two propagation steps. So this very reactive radical will take a hydrogen off the ethane in this case and will produce a hydrogen chloride molecule. And so we're left with a new radical at C2H5, so that would be an ethyl radical. And that dot there is just showing that it's a radical. It's got an unpaired electron. The second propagation step the new radical that's formed feeds into the second step. It reacts with some chlorine that hasn't been split up yet, and we get C2H5Cl could form, and a new radical gets formed in the process. So the way I think about propagation steps is that you have a sort of a, a molecule that's not a radical. With a radical, you create a different radical and a different non-radical substance. The final step is called termination, and that's where two radicals can combine and form a non-radical substance. So there are a few options here. So we've got two chlorine radicals could combine and form chlorine. Um, a chlorine radical and an ethyl radical could form chloroethane. And you could even get two ethyl radicals combining to form butane. So you can see again, not the best method if you want to make some, a single substance. And then finally, we'll look at this. If the chlorine was in excess, remember I said on the previous slide, further substitutions can occur. And so we need to go back to the propagation stage. So if you think about it, we've just made this substance, this non-radical substance. If the chlorine's in excess, we're going to have loads of these knocking about. And so therefore, we can form another hydrogen chloride molecule. And that's going to take this to this radical here and then that would react with Cl2, and you can see now we've got a dichloroalkane. And that could ultimately keep going until we've got all the hydrogens replaced or substituted by the chlorines.